say in the Cambridge session, but which does establish perhaps a degree of credibility that goes even beyond that of Hyminsky, whom I revere and whom I learned from, is that I arrived in Cambridge on virtually the same day as Joe Stiglitz right over there. <laughs> Joe went off on his trajectory. I went off on a 35-year sabbatical from academic economics, returning in time, as I said this afternoon, for 2008 to make economics a really interesting subject again. But what, now do I have a device? You I have a device. device. Yeah. So we're going to talk about productivity, Adair and I. And Eric is going to chime in from his perspective. And the productivity puzzle is illustrated by this graph, which was in the Financial Times a couple of years ago. But it's the long-term decline in productivity across the developed world. Of course, the super, the, the blue line, the light blue line is Japan in the 60s. 8% growth in productivity is not sustainable. That's rebuilding after World War II. And Germany's right up there around the, the yellow line. But Europe, that's Europe generally. But it has declined. There was this upbeat, uptick in the dot-com, internet, telecom bubble of the late 90s. Productivity did tip up the valuation tipped up a hell of a lot more. That's one reason why I'm sitting here with you right now. I, I wrote, when I wrote my thesis for Richard Kahn, it was on 1929-31. At the front end of that, I'd seen the movie of 1999 before. At the back end of that, I'd seen the movie of 2008 before. But how do we explain what's going on? Well, the first issue, a set of issues that have been uh, explored by numerous scholars of, of, of real distinction interrogating the kind of masses of data we now have is that there have to be mismeasurement issues. We've been digitalizing the world. We've been virtualizing the world. Eric Brynjolfsson and his sidekick, Dr. O at MIT, have got a big program going on trying to find ways to measure missing output because we do the work that bank clerks and travel agents used to do. But our work isn't counted in GDP. Philippe Aguillon has a team working on the overstatement of inflation because the way new goods and services are brought into the index is by looking at the price of the comparable goods and services that they're replacing. But they're replacing them because they're cheaper. So they actually can get up to capturing something like 50 basis points of 175 basis points reduction in productivity. Diane Coyle at Manchester has been orchestrating a program at the Office of National Statistics that is looking at these multiple sources of shortfall in the measurement of output relative to how it used to be captured. The first, the technical term, is the hedonic correction for quality improvements. But when the quality improves so fast, and they've got an example that in telecommunications, if we look at telecommunications of all sorts, voice, video, data, as the cost of bits per second, the cost of bits per second in the last five years in Britain, it's declined by more than 90%. That is not captured in the measurement of GDP. Second, her term is we cross the production boundary, which the statisticians of GDP have been wrestling with for 70 to 80 years. In other words, when we do the kind of work that people used to get paid for, we do it at home. It's not counted in GDP. So that's an exercise in trying to document and extend the Brynjolfsson research program. 
the third, which I actually am very tuned into, is, you know, GDP, like the calculation of your exposure to VAT, is a net number. It's net of the intermediate goods and services that go into producing final output. OK, 10 years ago, if you're a corporate entity and you want to process more transactions, you have to buy a lot of computers, right? Today, you have an increasingly competitive, radically improving competitive choice. You go to Amazon, and you buy a service. So instead of buying a computer that's included in GDP as an investment, you're buying an intermediate service that is netted out of final output. That magnitude is a big subject of research at the Office of National Statistics. Nobody has a handle on it yet. Now, with respect to all of these management issues, Chad Syverson from Chicago did an article in the Journal of Economic Perspectives last, just last spring in which he challenged all of the mismeasurement issues because of these four pieces of evidence. The slowdown, he says, is, un, is, correlate, is uncorrelated with investment in ITC across countries. The GDI, GDP gap, that's the fact that the measurement of national income for the last 20 years has exceeded the measurement of national output. Now, what that says is people are getting paid to do work that is not captured in GDP. What's that work? Open source software. There's a perfect example. People get paid to write extensions to this huge array of open source software. And by the way, Monday morning, little out of step advertisement, you're going to hear from Tim O'Reilly, who was the guru established the legitimacy of open source software some 25 years ago. So that's an example of where national income exceeds national output. Uh, but it began before and is not directly related to the slowdown in productivity since the internet bubble. And then finally, the modest size of the estimates of what we're missing in GDP just isn't big enough. Even Aguillon's calculation isn't big enough. And the growth rate, if it were all because we're underestimating the extraordinary productivity gains from the semiconductor to the software to the cloud services industry, their growth in, in output would have to be a factor of something like five times what we're measuring to account for the shortfall. OK, so let's just say that the measurement issues are contested, and they need more work. But we're talking about a phenomenon that we've seen a couple of times before. Technological transformation does not happen all at once. This is, goes all the way back to 1962. Everett Rogers proposed the process through which the diffusion of technology takes place as an extended, there's no years, there's no time horizon on the x-axis here, but you should expect that that's measured in decades, not years. By the way, this is what Bob Gordon has absolutely wrong. It took 50 years to build the railway infrastructure of his second industrial revolution, of his first industrial revolution. 50 years. 50 years before, as Brad DeLong, who's out there somewhere, wrote about in 2003, the killer app for the railway age was invented. It was mail order retail. <coughs> Montgomery Ward was established 49 years after the Baltimore and Ohio Railway construction began, and Sears Roebuck took another 10 years to be founded. 
So the fact that we're now 50 years from the microprocessor, we should not expect that the digital revolution is over. Paul David, I'm not even using the Bob Solo quote that you've heard till you're bored, but it's now almost 30 years because this article, of course, with the lag in the top journals was actually written in 1989. So it's 28 years since Paul David, great economic historian, wrote the response to Solo, and the punchline is in red. In 1900, contemporary observers well might have remarked that the electric dynamos were just being seen everywhere but in the productivity statistics. So what's going on now? In this technological revolution, we do have some very interesting data. This is the OECD data published in big series of reports over the last 18 months, the best versus the rest. This is the top 5% across the OECD countries, the productivity growth of the top 5% across multiple manufacturing and service sectors. That's really important service sectors. What you can see here is that since 2000, the top 5% have seen their productivity increase by almost 40% in manufacturing and in services, it's more than 40%. And the rest, the 95%, this kind of reminds you of the income distribution data on the growth of income. The top 90% are barely above where they were more than 15 years ago. Andy Haldane, had the Bank of England run the same kind of analysis on 30,000 British firms over a period that reaches back, again, just to the start of the millennium and brings it up to date. The top line, the black line, that's not the top 5%. That's the top 1%. The 90th percentile is in blue. That's the gap that has opened up back to Back to Paul David. Now this is an exercise in unbridled, naked, commercial mercantilism. My book, Doing Capitalism, that Steve didn't refer to, which is still available in its first edition at an Amazon website near you, <laughs> will be coming out from Cambridge University Press in March in a second edition with an entirely new chapter on the digital revolution and how the relationship between the digital revolution and the state has been inverted. Far from needing the sponsorship of the state, the great digital champions are now challenging the authority of the state. But along the way, learning from Paul David, what's important to remember is that in 1900, in 1910, in 1920, if you wanted to take advantage of electricity as the motive force for your manufacturing business, you had to hire double E's out of MIT, maybe out of Cambridge. You had to buy your own motors. You had to buy your own generators. You had to wire it all up. And all you had when you were done was a central power plant that replaced the steam engine and was still running your factory off the belts and pulleys that had been installed when it began being driven by a water mill. It was the invention of unit drive and, above all, the electricity grid that meant you could just plug it in. Just plug it in, you moved your machine tools around, you could reconfigure your manufacturing process without tearing down the building. And Alexander Fields has documented how in the 1930s, the companies that survived the financial crisis and the downturn had the highest growth of manufacturing productivity in the history of the United States. Today, up until about three years ago, if you wanted to take advantage of the unfair advantage created by digitalizing your commercial processes, you had to go out and hire your own data scientists. 
you had to buy your computers, bring in people who, by the way, I don't know how many young students we have out, young scholars we have out there, but entry-level data scientists are now being paid more than entry-level analysts at Goldman Sachs. There is enormous demand, but it's being in process, like the by the electricity grid with electrification, it's in process of being commoditized. This is off the Amazon website. Not going to read it to you. <laughs> AWS is saying, we're going to give you not just computing, not just storage, not just processing. We're going to give you analytics in the cloud. By the way, Microsoft trailing, you know, you always have to have a better, unique selling proposition. If you go on the Microsoft Azure website, they will tell you, we're going to give you machine learning in the cloud. You just give us your data. Google, which is trailing Microsoft, has it one step further. We're going to give you AI in the cloud. So the rest are going to gain access to the secret sauce that has been driving the incredible productivity gains. And you saw that in some of the earlier presentations, the productivity, the, the number of users per engineer of the top companies, which are, of course, now the most highly valued companies in the world, the uh, fearful five, as they're usually called, or known as the, the fang companies. But but the best keep getting better. And this is a new economic phenomenon. Now, when Tim O'Reilly and I first got to know each other back in the early 90s, we were very much out there recognizing that the source of value from technology, from IT, was moving and moving fast from hardware to software. Hardware was being commoditized. Value was in the software that could run on top of cheap, low to no profit hardware. Well, I have to say again, it's about a dozen years ago that Tim started telling me, guess what? Value is moving from software to data. With open source software, with the cloud, the software is being commoditized. And the value is in the data, capturing the data that is generated through transactions, through interactions, across the net, and then learning what to do with the data. And the dirty secret that anyone you may know, and certainly if they're at Microsoft Research, Google Research, Facebook Research, Amazon Research, they will tell you more data dominates better algorithms because by training your algorithms on more data, you get better algorithms. If you have better algorithms, you have a higher quality, more valued service, you get more data. There's a positive feedback loop here, which is different in kind, but complements, extends the traditional sources of competitive advantage and market power the economies of scale, the economies of scope, ch championed by the great Albert Chandler, and the network externalities that we grew to know and love in the context of the Microsoft Intel duopoly in the first generation of applied IT. Now, the tr problem here is just like with the other sources, of competitive advantage generated by positive feedback, by the disequilibrating processes of non-mean reverting positive feedback, where's the countervailing force? Well, we've seen some stirrings of that from the European Commission. One of the, let us say, not front page headlines for the Daily Mail on where Britain is exposed in leaving Europe is that the European Commission has undoubtedly been the most advanced in recognizing this new market power that is being generated by the digitalization of the world of work, the world of leisure, the world of communications, the world of life. But that's where we are, that's where we're going, 
This is not an explanation of the productivity puzzle, but it's a way of thinking about that I offer you. Thanks very much. Does it come up? You start clicking. I there start clicking. There we go. There go. Well, um, this evening, Mike Spence was meant to be played uh, by, uh, by the team manager, Rob. Um, he was meant to be the main scorer uh, out there, with uh, Eric as the sort of goalkeeper trying to catch one or two things. But Mike uh, uh, had to be taken off uh, injured. Uh, but Rob has played a couple of substitutes, uh, me and Bill. And because he only asked these substitutes to play uh, during the course of today, um, it could have been an entirely uncoordinated uh, pr uh, process, but fortunately... And, and, and there I do have to say that George notwithstanding, neither of us have a no Nobel Memorial Prize. Yeah, but but I, was I was just thinking that the way it works is that if Hyman Minsky said a nice thing about you and George Soros kind of said, that's obviously half a Nobel Prize because it there you go. the two of us together equal <laughs> one. So we were, we were played as substitutes. Um, and well done. We could have been entirely coordinate, uncoordinated, but quite fortuitously, both of us had been thinking about some of these technological issues, and both of us, we had a starting point of the productivity puzzle. Yeah. And what I'm going to show you is some filleted bits from a lecture that I actually gave at Asimprenji University uh, in Bangalore uh, three weeks ago, where we have a, a, an, an INET joint venture. Uh, which I will, over the course of the next two weeks, get round to turning into a full uh, text. Uh, but at least for the purposes of this evening, if you disagree with anything I say, I will be able to say well, it will all be clear when you see uh, the full text. My starting point in that lecture is a technological optimism. I am convinced by the work of Brynjolfsson and McAfee and others that we are in the middle of and on the verge of an even further acceleration of a very deep technological revolution, and that information and communications technology is not just another general purpose technology, but something even more profound. That if you t look at the remarkable progress of hardware cost and performance in Moore's Law, if you look at the fact that software is infinitely recoverable at zero marginal cost, if you look at the capacities to develop artificial intelligence and that once we get to human level artificial intelligence, we will then automatically accelerate to super intelligence, if you look at machine learning and if you look at big data, it is a reasonable hypothesis, I argue at the beginning of this lecture, that we will eventually automate almost all functions which we call work today. That will take time. <laughs> How fast we do it uh, will depend on what the cost of labor is, whether it's economic to do, but I want to get the proposition that that's where we're heading, and that's what we'll do, if not in the next 10 or 20 years, or even 30 years, in the next 70 or 80. I think what is clear, though, is that on the path to that, there are some things which are more automatable than others. And there's a fine piece of work being put forward by the McKinsey Global Institute, which has broken down what work activities actually involve in terms of physical dexterity or cognitive work, and given how far we've got in terms of machines that can replicate those different activities, what of the amount of time spent in current activity, in, in activities today, could already be automated with current technology? And you start with things like accommodation and food services could be automated, manufacturing be automated, and at the other end, there are some difficult things that are less automatable. Now, suppose that's true, and I'm going to come back to it. The question and we've been told it might be a slightly boring question if you mention solo, but this is the way I'm going to put it. Why are these figures not in the productivity statistics? And what I'm going to suggest is that there isn't a paradox in solo, or at least that that paradox is going to be explained by another couple of paradoxes uh, which I will set out. Sometimes I think in economics, in order to think straight, we need to go back to absolute basics and to set up very simple models. And I think it's worth noting that when most of us think about productivity improvement, we start with a sort of mental model which goes agriculture to manufacturing. That once upon a time, there were 100 self-sufficient farmers who produced 100 units of food. There was an agricultural revolution, and they were 50 farmers were able to produce 100 units of food, 50 surplus 
workers went off to a factory and produced cars, washing machines, and televisions, and measured total economy productivity doubles. And in our standard mental model, this is an endlessly repeatable process. Because in the next period, there is further technological progress. We now have 25 farmers producing 100 units of food. We've got 50 factory workers producing 200 cars, washing machines, and televisions. 15 have now moved off to produce computers, mobile phones, and software. And we've now got 10 service workers producing 40 units of healthcare, and that they can be automated again and again. So our idea is we have some basic functions that can be automated, people then move to other sectors of the economy which can also be automated. But suppose instead of that progress, what happens in the first step is that 100 farmers, 50 farmers produce 100 units of food and 50 domestic servants get paid half as much and produce 50 units of value. Agricultural productivity doubles, but total economy productivity increases only 50%. And I think there's an argument that this is what happened in the first agricultural productivity revolution, by which I mean what happened in the Fertile Crescent in about 8,000 uh, years uh, ago. This I've called the Baumol effect, because of course it was well described in The Economics of Unbalanced Growth by William Baumol uh, about 30 years ago. And in this environment, if you repeat this again and again, it's not an endlessly repeatable process, it's an asymptote in which productivity eventually slows down. And this, of course, needn't be that they've moved off to be uh, domestic servants who are paid half as much. It could also be true even if some of them had moved off to be very highly paid people. Artists, singers, entertainers, and fashion designers are entertaining and looking after the luxury needs of, of these farmers. But as long as their activity also can't be automated, eventually productivity uh, will a uh, asymptote. And I think it's worthwhile thinking about why would you have a Baumol effect? What would determine the intensity of the Baumol effect? And I think the answer is it will depend on, oops, let me click, it will depend on these three points. First, as we move to newly emerging economic activities, are those newly emerging economic activities inherently automatable? or do we move into things which cannot be automated? Second, the impact of productivity increase on the income distribution. I did all the value in that first step accrue to the farmers, which will be determined a bit by who owns the assets. And thirdly, the consumption choices of the winners from the initial productivity increase. And broadly thinking, I believe that if we are back in the 1950s, and if a large amount of the increment of productivity growth is going into the hands of middle Americans who do not yet have washing machines and cars and televisions but want them, and they want things which in themselves are automatable, you will get a different pattern of productivity uh, repeat in each progress than in an environment where a large amount of the benefits of the present productivity increase are going into the hands of richer people who are spending money on luxury goods or on face-to-face -face services. So proposition one I have is that part of what is driving the low productivity improvement is that there's fantastic productivity improvement going on in some sectors of the economy, but we are proliferating low productivity, low wage jobs, which bring down the average. Do we actually see these Baumol activities, as I call them? Well, here's an interesting picture. This is 21st century technology in London. This is a Deliveroo driver uh, delivering a, a pizza or anything else uh, you want uh, with this amazingly advanced uh, piece of technology uh, called the bicycle. And I think what this suggests is, I think we may have a paradox that works as follows, that the more rapidly technological progress enables the automation of existing activities, the more that high-touch jobs may grow in activities which at least for now cannot be automated or where, something's gone wrong with the text there, or wages are low enough to make automation uh, uneconomic. But for a variety of reasons, uh, that's what's occurred. So that's effect number one that I think is going on. Effect number two, going back to our simple model, is what if 
the 50 farmers produced 100 units of food and 25 of the remaining people became <laughs> criminals and 25 were police paid the same as farmers. Well, in this environment, total measured productivity increases 25% for the arbitrary GDP accounting reason that we count, count police as part of GDP, we don't count uh, criminals, but no human welfare benefit uh, has resulted. And when you get zero-sum activities, there are two separate questions. Have they increased human welfare and what shows up in GDP? Now, do we see zero-sum activities in the modern economy and do we see increasingly more of them over time? <laughs> I think you could say that a lot of these activities are zero-sum. I'm on the board of two major financial institutions. I receive incredibly in-depth briefing from our cyber defense experts who are helping to defend us against the cyber criminals attempting to attack us. This is clearly not increasing human welfare. Uh, this is a zero-sum activity. All the activity of bad selling practices, financial regulators, compliance officers, compensation lawyers. What about all legal services? <laughs> now, clearly divorce lawyers. I mean, think about this. Suppose more and more clever people become divorce lawyers, but an equal number are for the man and the woman, or equally clever. There will be no impact in terms of the output. It'll be the same as before, but we will have a lot more high-paid people in that area. And you see the other list there, and I've even suggested at the bottom that even some activities of academic economists lobbying for and against particular points of view might fall into these zero-sum activities, though I admit that's really stretching the point. I mean, very few people uh, would believe uh, that. Now, I think what's interesting about that is if you get a proliferation of this, and from in the lecture I suggest if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, I think we are getting a proliferation of these types of activity. I think there are more and more of these types of jobs uh, in the economy. Whether or not this shows up in GDP is an arbitrary accounting convention. If the lawyers are all becoming divorce lawyers, that's in GDP, though not necessarily in human welfare, because that's an end consumption service. If they're all becoming corporate lawyers to fight against each other on patent law, etc., that's not in GDP, because it's intermediate service. So I think we have in our economy a huge proliferation of these zero-sum activities, some of which may be depressing the measured growth rate of GDP, and even those which aren't may not be increasing human welfare. So my second paradox, which also has gone through some tricky bit of uh, gremlins, but let me try and get it right, is that the more rapidly, uh, the, 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 the rapid technological progress could eventually automate away all the activities which are truly essential for human welfare, while supporting increased intensity of zero competition for relative income and status, so that zero-sum activities end up accounting for a relentlessly increasing percentage of employment and measured output over time. And I think actually what's going on in our economies is that the underlying productivity growth rate is far faster than we think, but that we find things to do. Go back to Keynes, economic possibilities for our grandchildren. A hundred years hence, we might have a 15-hour work week. I think if it was the case that people had a higher leisure preference, and if the distribution of income enabled everyone to enjoy an adequate standard of living with 15 hours work, we would actually produce the vast majority of all the goods and services essential for our standard of living with far fewer worker hours, and we'd be looking at a far higher measured productivity rate, but we find things to do because of status considerations and positional goods, because you need to have individually adequate minimum inc income requirements, and that may not be possible on 15 hours a week, and because work is a social activity. All of which may seem a bit negative, but there may be something positive going on the other side, and Bill has already mentioned it. There may be underestimated productivity and real income growth. If you look at the way that in GDP we measure new drugs, mobile phones and tablets, streamed films and music, computer games, social networks, we clearly have incredibly rapid productivity improvement. We have falling prices and increasing uh, quality. 
But as Bill has already said, uh, quoting Philip Agon, when you look at the details of how GDP looks at those, they don't capture uh, those falls in prices. And so Marty Feldstein has actually used that to argue that there isn't a poverty and real uh, income uh, a slow growth stagnation problem at all. The result is that the increase in real incomes is underestimated and that the common concern about what appears to be the low growth of average household incomes is misplaced. These low growth estimates fail to reflect the innovations in everything from healthcare to internet services to video ent entertainment which have made life better during the last years. Now, I think that what Marty's saying there is partly true but not necessarily wholly true and I don't think it's an adequate answer to the problems of real income growth, and this is why. It seems to me clear that we could ask two separate questions. Do low productivity growth estimates fail to reflect super rapid productivity growth, falling prices, increased quality, and innovation in specific products and in entertainment? I think the answer is almost certainly yes, and possibly by quite a large amount. The second question, however, is does that mean that human welfare improvement has been understated? Well, certainly I would think if we are understating the value of wonderful new drugs that increase human welfare. But is it clear that always on mobile devices and ever better computer games have made life better? Or ask yourself this question. Suppose you went and talked to someone on low income who felt that their household budget was under great stress as a result of housing costs and transportation costs, and you said to them, you're not really poor because that computer game that your 15-year-old is playing has 10,000 times as much computing power as the computer that put a man on the moon, they might not find that an entirely compelling <laughs> argument. So roll forward to the end of this century, and let's imagine a world in which solar-powered robots programmed by a small number of very clever people who write the software that writes the software that writes the software, so you only need a small number of people to write a little bit of the software, do pretty much everything that we think of as work. In that environment, is there anything for us as economists to do? Does the economy even exist? Economics, we're told, is about the allocation of scarce resources in consumption and production processes. Well, if robots do all of the work, is there scarcity? Well, my hypothesis is that when we get to the end of that process, we will still have a thing called money GDP, but it will be dominated by real property ownership values and rents, by intellectual property rents left over by this whole progress of innovation which will have occurred over this century, the value of which will be entirely determined by what our legal and distributive approach was to whether we like intellectual property rents or not. It will also relate to, there's a typo there, subjective brand values and rents. People will be creating perfumes or designs or handbags or, which have luxury good names attached to them which, as it were, just subjectively have a value, and they'll be uh, in GDP, and the very high incomes of a very small number of people, skilled or lucky, in IT, in subjective value creation, design and branding, or in categories of zero-sum competition, because there'll still be a lot of very high-paid divorce lawyers. And the income distribution of that money GDP will determine the distribution of the consumption of scarce positional or status goods. Everybody will have as much food and as much clothing as they need, but the crucial bit that the economy will be about is about the allocation of in incomes which determine the allocation of the enjoyment of scarce uh, uh, positional uh, goods uh, and status goods. Finally then, what, if this is right, are the challenges for public policy? No, uh, uh, for, for economics and for public policy. First, on economics, I'd like to suggest that we will slowly have to move our focus. That we have had for many years a focus that assumes that the fundamental problem is how to increase productivity in a two-factor capital plus labor model of, comp of competition. And that that is the fundamental challenge which we are seeking to achieve. And I think that's actually the bit that we'll solve. I think we're going to have 
very rapid underlying productivity growth. I think we will have to, as economists, increasingly focus on issues like real property rents and urban geography, returning to a three-factor model, which Ricardo would have understood, capital, labor, and land, and away from just a two-factor model. I think we'll have to think very seriously about environmental negative externalities and congestion externalities, about how we want to treat intellectual property rents, network externalities, and return to monopoly of the sort that Bill was just talking about. Debt, positional goods, financial instability, and inequality. And then we'll also have to think a lot about development challenges in job creation, and we'll have to think a lot about income distribution, because given that people need those positional goods, which is the ability to move around the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the space on congested transport and to enjoy housing, we'll have to think about how we ensure that everybody has a good standard of living in an environment where I don't think, uh, in a world of automation, everybody will be able to enjoy it. So finally, what might that imply for both developing and developed economies? Well, I put up that chart earlier of which activities are likely to automate earliest. And actually, some of the most clear ones which will automate earliest is manufacturing. And increasingly, I think the automation of manufacturing is going to move from hard things like little bits of metal in electronics to soft things like textiles and clothing. And I think once somebody works out how to have sobots that automate textiles and clothing, the problems of job creation in India and Africa are massively, massively increased. I don't know the answer to this, but what I think one of the huge issues for economics over the next 20 years is where are we going to get job creation in developing economies which still have rapidly growing populations in an environment where I think manufacturing is coming back to the developed world, but with hardly any jobs attached. As for what the challenges is in the developed markets, well, one of the really frustrating things about economics is that when you think you've got a remotely original idea, you find that a certain man got there 70, 87 years ago. Because the implication of what I'm saying for the developed rich economy is thus for the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem, how to use his freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy the leisure which science and compound interest will have won him to live wisely and agreeably and well. Thank you very much. No, slides. slides. Where are the slides? No, the mic. It's not the mic. It's where are the slides. 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 By the way, what? you know that um, Danny Rogers. Anyhow, um, I was waiting for the slides here. Oh, there. Oh. here we go. Yeah. Next. There you go. Hey, wonderful. <laughs> Good. So um, these are. Give me that empty glass. The, these are hard acts to follow. Uh, not only because they are very full presentation, but also because I had expected to be discussing <laughs> micro spend. So. Adair Turner and William Janeway, formerly known as Michael Spence. <laughs> the, uh, so, so what comes out of, uh, I think, both presentations is that uh, the productivity challenge is a very broad issue. It's something that has to do with, with technology, but it also has to do with um, 
a much broader social and political transformation. And uh, I think you can see this most clearly when you look at emerging and developing economies, and that's what I'm going to try to do. So it's about the productivity puzzle, but it's looking at it in, in, a, uh, in a broader way. And uh, of course, you, you, we should say that the productivity slowdown is, as you emphasize, not unique to the US. It's also true in Europe. It's also true in, in the major uh, emerging economies. So, so this is um, someone who also couldn't be here, um, uh, and <laughs> but otherwise, he, engaged. Uh, otherwise engaged. But um, he uh, he gave, as you know, a um, three-hour and twenty-three-minute long speech. And uh, since we are into this tonight, and, and quoting um, uh, various uh, people, uh, so what we know. What we now face is a contradiction between unbalanced and inadequate development and the people's ever-growing need for a better life. The needs to be met for the people to live a better life are increasingly broad. Not only have their material and cultural needs grown, their demands for democracy, rule of law, fairness and justice, security, and a better environment are increasing. While China's overall pro productive forces have significantly improved and in many areas our production capacity leads the world, a problem is that our development is unbalanced and inadequate. And so this is what I would call the structural transformation challenge, and I will call it a dual structural transformation challenge. So it's really, we have used structural transformation a lot uh, during this uh, proceeding so far, but it has a quite precise meaning to, to economists. It's about both the, the simultaneous or, or the combined changes in, in um, structures, economic structures, going from agriculture to, to manufacturing and so on, but also the accompanying changes in institutions. And all this, of course, now happens in the context of uh, rapid technological change and globalization, tightening constraints in terms of resources, both climate and, and ecological, and of course, social and uh, social constraints in terms of inequality, and exclusion. So, for, of course, for, for the emerging and developing economies, this is a dual transformation challenge. It's the catch-up challenge of, of uh, going from investment-led growth to innovation-led growth, but it's also a, a catching up with this constantly moving frontier and a rapidly moving frontier and tightening constraints. So what the advanced econ economies had to do in 50 or 100 years, they have to do in a much shorter period of time because that's what these constraints uh, tell you. Of course, the upside to this is that globalization has brought down, brought down some of the entry barriers to come into global value chains. I'll come back to that uh, later on. So that you can now join a segment of a value chain and you can, but you don't have to bruise the whole car. That has both positive and negative that we'll come back to. So, what is it that you do? Well, again, we have heard the word industrial policy and that this was something uh, that was for a long time maybe looked down on, and, and, uh, but it has come back with a vengeance. And because when you talk about policies to achieve this structural transformation, that is what I call industrial policy. So industrial policies are about changing both uh, economic structures and institutions, and of course, you know, what industrial policies you can actually implement is going to be affected by what state capacity you have. And uh, so there we have a lot of different uh, in industrial policy. We have the kind of traditional horizontal policies, which are about competition policy, corporate governance, uh, uh, the uh, investment environment, and so on. But we also have vertical policies where you try to identify individual companies, individual sectors, we have the maybe most extreme form in, is the entrepreneurial state, my, Mariana Mazzucata's uh, notion of a state that goes out, takes risks, and, and uh, behaves more or less like a venture capitalist. So these are, and, and these have been sort of viewed as state-driven transformation, but Bill, in his talk now, also in his book, talks about um, the, that we have turned the tables in a way, that now actually the industry itself is pushing the state in front of it. And I think I'll give you a very quick uh, a few examples of 
where this is happening and what the responses have been uh, to this. So I'm going to use two relatively successful uh, stories of uh, structural transformation and dual uh, transformational. So you take China. Here the, you have had very much a, a shift towards, you had a private sector, you had a private sector that in many ways, like Alibaba, for example, pushed the state in front of it. It uh, has now one third of the payment system. It has uh, enormous influence and managed to play out various regulators against each other. You, of course, have an older history of state intervention in China that has very mixed uh, results in, when it comes to technology. But when you look at what the state is doing now is in response to this uh, turning the tables as, uh, as uh, Bill has talked about. Well, it is now talking about uh, getting may, maybe uh, stakes in these companies. It's trying to use these companies to open up in a sense the same way that they earlier used the WTO. They are using the leverage that they have because there are a number of important elements for their success which are tied to licenses uh, in, a, in the financial services and self-driving in, in Baidu's case. So there, there are examples here of the state is uh, coming back and, and responding to this uh, turning of the tables. If you look at the emerging Europe, you have a very different uh, history, of course, and, but with extraordinary high levels of uh, FDI relative to GDP. You had massive cross-border lending and financial integration that turned out to be very vulnerable in the crisis. And these countries, they really became subsidiary economies. They grabbed these opportunities, they kind of subjugated themselves, they bec became part of, um, of global value chains, and it's been, as uh, was mentioned also in early in proceedings today, you know, were quite successful in terms of, uh, uh, of productivity, and they had had, you know, were relied mostly on broad invest uh, improvements in the investment climate. And of course, this was all achieved uh, very much thanks to the EU anchor. So, so if we go back to this dual transformation challenge and see how now these uh, two examples illustrates what, because what's happening? Well, in emerging Europe now, you have a major counter uh, reaction. You have a, a authoritarian tendency throughout the region. You have a, 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 a very uh, disillusionment with this uh, sort of subsidiary model where you had to take on all these rules and, and, and regulations, all these institutions from the outside, and they don't have uh, the same uh, uh, grounding in, in, the, uh, in the local environment. In China, well, the response is in a way similar. You have widespread protests throughout China. We, we don't read so much about them, and they are well managed, but they are uh, very widespread. There are very large expectations, and the quote that I gave of uh, from President Xi, I think reflects that concern over these uh, remarkable uh, uh, expectations. And this response is very much to insert the party everywhere. And uh, if there's one thing that characterizes uh, President Xi's first term, it was, was that. And, and you, you see it now, for example, if you go look at uh, uh, prospectuses in uh, Chinese companies listed in Hong Kong, you find these descriptions uh, uh, of of uh, the party's role in, 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 in the company. So these are uh, also, the, these challenges are also now have to deal with very uh, severe environmental challenges, both of course in terms of, of, of uh, uh, the air and, and water, but also more generally of the, the ecosystem in, 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 in China. And we are also now of course seeing changing technologies, and this is what very much has been the focus of, of Bill's and Adair's talk, you know, with these very dramatic political and social implications. And those implications are very much now also uh, something that China will face, and, uh, and, and, uh, and for that matter, Eastern Europe. It's not clear that these value chains have been established, that they will also survive uh, in, in this, um, in this uh, new uh, political and, and and economic environment. So I think just trying to illustrate that, that you know, technological change and productivity has to be seen in, in a much broader context. So thank you very much. <laughs>
There's no microphones out there. If you wanted to do questions, maybe we should just comment amongst ourselves. Okay, I think Rob's going to. Is Rob coming up? No. Rob is. He's going to come up and say something. Uh, so. so he, he's got a chair. He hasn't got a chair. No. Oh, I thought he was there. Rob, are you going to come up and loom over us? <laughs> are we, are we Make it questions? cheerful. Are we doing questions? Are we doing? No. Oh, we don't have mics. Yeah. Oh. My understanding is uh, the wonderful Steve Clements had to leave to do a television right. spot. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so there's a new. He's appointed me as his deputy. It's big shoes to fill. But uh, at any rate, if there are questions from the audience uh, for the speakers, I'd like. They want to first. One all the way to the far right here. I'll, I'll roll the microphone down in a minute. You better get somebody out there with one. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Anne Pettifor. Um, my question is this. It's that this, this future that both uh, Adair and, and, and uh, Professor Janeway have uh, outlined seems to me to be dystopian in, in many respects. And I agree with Pes Professor Bergloff that, you know, there are going to be political and social implications. But I, what no one seems to have taken into account is the fact that the resources needed for automation are finite. Uh, the thing called, the thing that, you know, drives our, that drives automation and lots of our iPhones and so on are known as rare earths, yeah. you know, and the clue is in the tin. Uh, is, on, is in the name on the tin. These earths are rare. These minerals that are so vital to automation are found in very sh small places, namely the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the extraction of these assets from the earth has already caused major political, social, and economic disruption. So the idea that we can go on forever automating seems to me sort of, if not utopian, at least dystopian. The great, the great Thomas Hughes, the historian of electrification, liked to talk about reverse salience, the, the barriers to extending the reach of the new technology. And there's no doubt dependence on rare earth elements in battery, and in, in lithium ion batteries and the microelectronics of mobile devices is, is one such. I do want to make um, a distinction between if you like, the timeline that I was addressing and the timeline that Adair was addressing. I was, um, if you like, in the short period, what mistakenly was typically thought of by neoclassical economics as the, the limited frame of um, Keynesian style uh, demand shortfalls. And Adair was talking about the long period. Uh, in a way, the, the good news about Adair's vision, which may be also the bad news, is that today the techniques for automation, and particularly machine learning, remain very brittle and in many respects very primitive and overwhelmingly dependent on that individual, that set of individuals who are doing the initial setup, who are defining what the training program for the machine learning algorithm is going to be. And I promise you that a Facebook or a Google machine learning application that is absolutely brilliant at recognizing dogs will have an absolute nervous breakdown when confronted with a picture of a cat. They are very brittle. They are a long way from being the kind of uh, AI style that Elon Musk is perhaps appropriately over a very long time frame, terrifying us about. Now, that doesn't immediately address the issue of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And I don't have any answer, short term or long term, for the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And that is not meant as a light throwaway line. It's meant that the issues there are deep. They go back to. King Leopold, they go back to the heart of darkness and the exploitation 
persist. No question about it. I don't think that that, in fact, is going to be a profoundly limiting factor yep. on the haphazard, highly uncertain method, manner in which these new technologies propagate, are employed, and generate in the short term the kind of political and social instabilities that we've all been talking about, both in the developed and the advanced economies and the emerging economies. Well, Anne, I do worry about dystopias, but not actually the dystopia you're worrying about. Um, so I think I worry an awful lot about climate change, an awful lot about fossil fuel use and the carbon limits of the atmosphere, but I happen to be convinced that we can build uh, renewable energy systems uh, which will replicate that and will support a very significantly higher level of uh, uh, electricity use uh, than we have uh, at the moment, uh, and that, for instance, we will electrify you know, the car fleet. And quite separate from automation, you know, if we can't do that, we've got a problem with fossil fuels, right? So the, 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 the problem uh, of are we short of rare earths, um, you know, is, is somewhat separate from this story about automation. Uh, we have a whole load of personal mobility uh, vehicles. They're not going to go away. Um, African people, as the population goes up, are going to demand them uh, as well. And I think unless we can move a lot of those to electric vehicles uh, with batteries, um, then we are going to fry the earth. Now, the good news is I do not believe that in sheer physical terms, rare earths will be a limit to that. There are two key different rare earths in lithium-ion batteries. One is lithium. And actually, there is not a shortage of lithium in the world. And most of the lithium is in quasi, uh, uh, you know, responsible and stable countries. Not entirely. We're talking Bolivia, Peru, Argentina, uh, Chile. That's where the big lithium deposits are. But the total amount which is there is massive. And the other great thing is that once you've got a lithium-ion battery, you don't have to and you mustn't throw the lithium away. So we have got to get much better at the recycling of it. Uh, these things should not be throwaway batteries, but we are capable of doing that and should do that. We have a short-term problem. We have, a, we have a problem with cobalt because cobalt comes from a particular area. It's not a problem, I think, in the long run of a physical shortage of cobalt in the sense that if the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Congo was, you know, Sweden, I, don't, I wouldn't worry at all about cobalt supplies. One worries about it, its interaction uh, with a, 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 an unstable and a corrupt political regime, which can then be corrupted by uh, the demand for cobalt. So I think there are hugely important issues for us to manage, but I do not believe that we are going to find rare earths as the limiting factor in our ability to decarbonize power, to increasingly electrify the economy from a climate change point of view, I think we are going to have, a, we are going to use electricity more and more. We are on the verge of a sort of new electricity uh, based uh, industrial uh, revolution. So I, I do disagree with that. And as I say, if I did think that, it's not so much that it would change my point of view on automation, it would make me convinced that we just will not be able to deal uh, with climate change unless we can go down that electrification route. I think the dystopia that we should worry about, and it's actually something Anatole uh, said this morning in the session on uh, secular stagnation, is, you know, does society just bifurcate uh, into some people who flourish uh, in this world that I described and some who don't? And if you really want to read a dystopia, read Tyler Cohen's book, Average is Over. So Tyler Cohen, uh, American economist, he uh, deliberately constructs this dystopia uh, of uh, increasing technological capability, reducing the need for work. And he says, but this is not going to lead to a social revolution of underemployed or poorly paid people because these poor people are going to live in cheap mini houses in warm places in Oklahoma and they're going to have computer games and they're going to be happy, and they're going to have, have enough food, and they're going to be just sort of docile. And he deliberately sets this out as a dystopia, 
Uh, and then he says, that, of course, there'll be talented people who don't like being in the positional rat race, but what they'll do is they'll move to low-income, hipsterish uh, places, maybe Detroit or Berlin, where the, uh, the cost of uh, uh, property is low, and they'll just opt out of the rat race, and, and they'll be happy as well. It's a book worth reading, um, because I think it describes a way that eco economies and societies could develop, but I think the challenge is to make sure that they don't, and I think that's the main challenge that comes out of what I'm saying, rather, I, I would have to say, Anne, uh, than the limits created by rare earths. Okay. Uh, just uh, so another dystopia that I worry about that I didn't mention in my discussion, but I said that a lot of the um, uh, globalization has so far helped countries to enter uh, into these global value chains because you could come in with a very small part of, of cars, for example, then rather the whole car. But I think there is, because of these technological developments, a, a re very real possibility that these kind of pathways to development and joining the global economy may close. And if some of these technologies may not be available and, and or even open up these opportunities for uh, emerging and developing economies. And that's another uh, dystopia at the global level that I worry about. Well, Steve Clemens set this up as a competition, so I <laughs> guess I have to offer my dystopia. My dystopia is very simple. My dystopia is that the popular, I didn't say populist, the popular responses to digitalization and globalization that we've been experiencing are from, from Budapest to Washington by way of London, if not Edinburgh, not Edinburgh, that that's the new normal. And we're gonna have to learn to live with it. That's my dystopia. It's up to you to do something about it. Okay. Over there. Uh, yeah, one more okay. Uh, just a question from the Kaku University of Economics. That too get discussed for slowly. For long? slowly. Okay, good. Can't just a message from the Krakow University of Economics. We could discuss for hours, but what is important in your presentation, which is very inspiring, is when we look from the point of view of complex systems. Of course, we could elaborate more, elaborate more on that. So I have two points. My first point is that we could observe that the, we, when you talk about inequality, we could observe that the people are, have their needs fulfilled at the lowest level of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy, then we could see new phenomena that inequality in terms of information so could, could, could increase. Of course, a topic for another research. And my second point is this, not the problem of amount of information, Something is something somehow deeper. It's a problem of overwhelming interpretation of this information. I think uh, we could elab elaborate much more on this. So this is, there are two basic challenges, namely for so all the social phenomena, the discrepancy between the people who are, who, whose needs are fulfilled at the lowest level of the Maslow hierarchy, and the second one, the new revolution is not the information revolution. Is the information of the overwhelming of meanings. Thank you very much. Well, I actually disagree quite fundamentally with the second point. I don't think we have too many interpretations. I think we have too many facts. You know, my, the, 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 the Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to find, no, 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 uh, I'm pointing out you're wrong. You keep yeah, going. Yeah. We're, we're just, <laughs> okay. <laughs> The, we got too many meanings. We, we, had, we, had, a, we, we had a breakdown of our substitution coordination there. Too, too many interpretations. Mike Spence would have if you integrated been one Mike that. Spence instead of two of you, that never That's would have right. happened. But I do think, I do think um, if we're offering books to read, Larry Bartel's book, Unequal Democracy, which has just come out in a second updated edition. I'm very sensitive and very responsive to the second updated editions. Um, <laughs> does give a lot of documentation of that um, the Pat Moynihan was wrong when he said you're entitled to your own opinion but you're not entitled to your own facts. The, the amount of facts that are believed deeply that just aren't so, that are deployed, accepted the foundation for action, uh, including voting, is pretty astounding. And um, I think that that goes back to, is this the new normal? Is this the normal where uh, 
um, you're entitled to your alternative fact because it happens to buttress your own, whether it's economic interest if you're a Coke, or your emotional requirement if you're one of those people in the um, in, in, in the in the Oklahoma who wakes up from their opioid nightmare, yeah. right? Because that's what they're doing, yeah. right? They're not uh, uh, they're not on soma, yeah. um, so that's that's what I worry about. I worry about too many facts. Thank you so much. Uh, Stanislav Schmelev, uh, Director of Environment Europe in Oxford and also visiting lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. Um, Lord Turner outlined a very um, exciting but uh, deeply frightening uh, picture of the world in 50 years' time. And um, I, I will give you a couple of reasons why I think so. Uh, first of all, we cannot manage right now a set of extremely important problems that our civilization is facing. 260 million tons of plastics is currently floating in the world's ocean. There is no end to this, and uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, changing in any way. The world has lost about half of its biodiversity in the last 40 years. Yeah. Uh, that's only a beginning. Then um, imagine everything is automated and everybody has you know, lots of time on their hands. We discard for a moment those of us who are creative enough to keep writing, gardening, and painting, and so forth. Um, there was a very interesting case a few years ago in Switzerland. You know, uh, in Switzerland, um, there was quite a habit for, um, you know, wives not to work. That was a very social kind of, you know, accepted norm. And suddenly they realized that the suicide rate of, you know, yeah. these women went up tremendously. So, you know, I, I could go on and on and on. And I would be really grateful if you could respond to these few points. You know, what do you prefer, what are you prepared to do about all of this, for instance. Thank you. Well, it's up to you. I, 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 I mean, I, I was not suggesting these issues are easy. Indeed, the, the point about that Fain's final Keynes quote is that you're, you're raising two separate questions, and they're both uh, important. Suppose there were no physical limits, right? Things like plastics and biodiversity. Um, this story of automation would still be an immense social challenge. And when Keynes said man will face his final, his permanent, his most important challenge, he meant this is going to be very, very difficult. He didn't say, and that will be an easy thing to deal with. I think a world in which we have automated away the world for work is going to require the most extraordinary, uh, thoughtful social and political dialogue to make that a workable society, because I think it could end up uh, as a complete uh, dystopia. So, you know, I agree with you, and I think one of the problems is that, you know, we, we discussed it a bit this morning on the secular stagnation thing, well, Till Van Treek said, why isn't there more leisure? Um, the fact is, I, I think we could probably have societies which have significantly more leisure. What you can't have is just whole groups of people not working at all, because you know, work is a, is a social status thing. It's a, it's a, it's a process from which people get, get value and engagement and contact with other people. So you know, I, wasn't, I was absolutely not implying that these are easy uh, in terms of, it wouldn't be easy even if there weren't physical limits. Then when you go to the physical limits, I think they're somewhat independent of the automation. I think we do face physical limits on biodiversity, et cetera, but I think those, to the extent that they would exist, you know, are not driven by automation. And indeed, on the whole, I think automation will enable us to be somewhat more efficient in our energy use uh, than we are at the moment. So I think these are two really quite uh, separate, uh, separate issues. Um, you know, I care a lot about the biodiversity thing. I care a lot about the plastic stuff. In fact, I happen to be involved in some work at the moment precisely, so I'm absolutely steeped in uh, these issues of uh, plastics recycling, which is a massive problem both in terms of its impact on the oceans and also is actually going to be an increasingly important problem from climate change. Uh, once we decarbonize power, you, you then start finding that the really difficult things on decarbonization are going to be steel production, cement production, and plastics, and the non-recycling of plastics. And those are uh, what in some work with, uh, that a, a commission that I'm doing is, is doing is called, we call the hard-to-abate sectors. I, I think we know the answers 
for where we're going to get heat from and where we're going to get surface transport from, uh, I think those are, are much more difficult issues. So uh, in a sense, I'm, I'm simply agreeing with you. I, I just would add one thing. Uh, going back to Adair's presentation, his slides, this process, the succession of short runs on the way to what may or may not be a long run dystopia, but certainly is an enormous challenge, comes by way of this kind of sectoral shift and radical distributional consequences. Now, one of the good things about what's going on in economics and finance since 2008, indeed, is the rediscovery of distribution as a subject for economics. I like to say that one of the consequences of Lucas's article of the Chicago Triumph a generation ago was that allocation ate economics. <laughs> the only problem for economists was the efficient allocation of resources. If, 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 if the, if the um, uh, resources in production get their marginal product, what could be fairer than that? Distribution disappears. Yep. And if that rational optimizing agent yep. entered temporarily, knowing the full consequences of her actions, offsets any government, then stabilization disappears as a subject for, for economic study. So we're back there. But these interim transitional problems, these are dynamite. Yep. Yep. And you know, we have been here before. My last, uh, perhaps, contribution to your reading list is Harold James. The End of Globalization, the first time around from 1900 at the peak of global of the first globalization. Well, the response to that was the worst 30 years the world has known since the Treaty of Westphalia, 1914 to 1945. Let's hope we can do a little better than that this time around. Rob, there's a lady back okay. there. Uh, I, think, I think we're going to have to tie it up for the evening. Oh. We've got a couple of long days. Yeah. Two more. Uh, but two I, more. I want to say. Two more. I want to say to you that. Uh, oh, please get a package. I can feel the energy around this subject. <laughs> there is so much energy, and when I walked up on stage, I offered to to a poem, and Bill Janeway told me, "Okay, as long as it's cheerful." And then he went and talked about the Congo and the heart of darkness, and two <laughs> other guys started talking dystopias, and I knew you all really needed me. So as I sat and listened, I thought about my days back at school at MIT. One of my professors was a man named Hubert Dreyfus. He wrote a book that was called Mind Over Machine. Oh, great book. So I thought I'd try to cheer you all up. When I was on the music scene, a friend brought me a drum machine. He said it's better and it's cheaper too. I didn't quite know what to do. So I listened, and you should too. He came to me. He said, what's the deal? I said, I'll stick with human feel. <laughs> Thank you all. We'll see you in the morning.